I'm Jed Buckwald, the director of the Research Institute and professor of history of physics here at Caltech. Uh, this is the second year of this institute, and we have been very lucky to have Sophia Kalantakis, distinguished professor of uh, environmental studies and public policy at NYU and NYU Abu Dhabi uh, with us, despite the difficulties of, that the pandemic has produced uh, over the past two years. And indeed this conference, which is of course being held on Zoom, would normally have uh, been held directly at Caltech. But nevertheless, things have gone very well. Sophia has done a fantastic job here under these circumstances and has put together a truly wonderful conference on a topic that is obviously of compelling contemporary interest, uh, both for its environmental, strategic, uh, political uh, <coughs> uh, issues. So without further ado, I will turn the session over to Sophia Kalantzakis. Now, uh, for those of you who have registered who may have questions, please use the Q&A facility provided by Zoom and uh, Sophia will garner the questions and uh, hand them out to the members of the panel. I'll turn it over to Sophia now, who will introduce uh, our set of distinguished speakers for the afternoon. Thank you very much for attending. Sophia. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, well, thank you, Jed. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the second session of Rich Rocks, the Climate Crisis, and the Tech Empyrean. This session is one of two we have scheduled to bring into conversation the industry, finance, and government world as decarbonization and digitalization intensify. We could not have hoped for a better group of people to give, kick off this discussion. Keith Bratcher, the New York Times Shanghai Bureau Chief and Senior Writer for Asia Economics and Business, will be discussing radioactive waste and organized crime, rare earth metals supply chains. He has graciously joined us from China and, he, and even though they're the early morning hours for him. When Konstantin Karayanopoulos, President, CEO and Director of NEO gave the title of his talk, Lessons from Three Decades in the Rare Earth Trenches, What Works and What Doesn't, he wasn't exaggerating. Konstantin's vast experience in the critical mineral sector will shed some valuable light on what is and is impossible, pointing to where rhetoric may be out of sync with the reality on the ground. Roderick Egert, Professor Viola Vestal Coulter, Foundation Chair in Mineral Economics, Deputy Director of Critical Materials Institute at the Colorado School of Mines, has a background in earth sciences, geochemistry, and mineralogy, as well as mineral economics and will bring an invaluable perspective on public policy toward rare earths and other critical materials. Finally, Chris Berry, president of House Mountain Partners LS LLC, has an important understanding of the finance industry government nexus and will be spotlighting the paradox of green growth, opportunities and challenges in decarbonizing the electric vehicle supply chain. I cannot wait to hear what they all have to say. Thank you for joining us. I pass the baton to Keith Bradshaw. Thank you very much, Sophia. Let me start with one of my first welcomes to a rare earth mine. Uh, this was in Southern China. And the first words that they said to me were, we are going to carve you up like an animal in a slaughterhouse. We are gonna carve you up like an animal in a slaughterhouse. This was a mine, an illegal mine run by organized crime in northernmost Guangdong. And I had taken a train up from Hong Kong to Guangzhou and then Guangzhou up to a little, little town, spent the night there and then gone out to first thing in the morning uh, to the mine, which should not have been in operation. In fact, it wasn't in operation at that hour, uh, but somebody uh, alerted them that I had gone into the mine with a photographer to look at the uh, look at some of the damage there, and it was a horrible mess. Uh, they had uh, destroyed all the agriculture in the valley with the uh, with their runoff. But uh, I had not been there long when two uh, carloads of gangsters uh, drove up next to me. 
Uh, and they made that threat, and I'll confess it caused complete confusion because they made it in Hakka, which I do not understand. It's a dialect spoken in northernmost Guangdong. Now, before I, I finish that story, uh, let me talk about some of the reasons why this industry has lent itself to often abusive environmental, environmental and uh, legal practices. It's because it has a long history of, of pollution. And as a result, people have been prone uh, to cutting corners on it. I'll give you another example of how the, this has been a rough industry. Uh, somebody I knew in Hong Kong when I was still living there before the New York Times transferred me to, uh, to Shanghai uh, once had a, a very sad incident uh, at his office. Uh, he was a, a rare metals trader. And one day, uh, one evening, when he was no longer in the office and his general manager was still working there, uh, uh, two people came in and tied up his general manager with uh, duct tape to his chair and then um, cut him up so badly with box cutters that he bled to death. And uh, his secretary came in the next morning was the uh, on her first day of work um, and was uh, horrified and never came back again. Um, so this is an industry that, that has had some really rough actors in it in parts of the world. Why does it have these, uh, these rough actors? It's because they're trying to avoid environmental standards. So uh, somebody else I know in the industry likes to tell the story of being taken in the trunk of a car to a facility, uh, a warehouse facility where rare earth metals were being separated in chemical vats and the, the waste being dumped out in municipal drains also in Southern China. Uh, these, these kinds of difficulties are, uh, are cost driven because this is a, in many ways, not really a mining industry. This is a chemicals processing and to some extent, radioactive waste disposal industry. Rare earth metals, as probably many people in this conference know, are widely found all over the world. Not necessarily in commercial concentrations, but they're not really rare. What's rare is finding jurisdictions that are willing to tolerate the mining. And what is even more rare is to find jurisdictions that are willing to tolerate the mining and at the same time to regulate it effectively so that it can be done safely. Um, the simplest way to process rare earths is often just to make uh, a series of clay pits outdoors and do your first step of processing there dumping in the, the ore in. And I've seen that as well at a different location in northernmost Guangdong, where the, the valley below had also been completely destroyed. Um, doing it that way is, is very damaging and leaves a, a residue that can be seen years later. I've also seen a, a mine there in northern Guangdong that, is, that was still unable to be used I think this was five years afterwards, that it looked as though they'd left the day before because nothing had managed to grow uh, downstream of where they'd been doing this processing. So if you look around the world, you'll see that there have been progressive efforts to move beyond these kinds of open clay pit processing towards more sophisticated and responsible mining and initial processing. So you had efforts in, you had operations in places like Australia, Japan, and France. And we'll get to the United States later. Each of those, however, ran into regulatory objections and you started, uh, and an ever tighter regulatory scrutiny and you started moving to, to different places in the developing world. 
So I visited another of those uh, in Ipoh, Malaysia some years ago. That was Mitsubishi. They had a factory, a, a processing operation that was processing um, tin tailings, which are much higher radioactive content than many of the rare earth mines in operation today. And they did not have a, a safe plan for disposing of the waste. Instead, it was even being handed out to local mango farmers as fertilizer being dumped by the sides of the roads. And it, whether it was directly caused or whether the correlation was clear or not, uh, local villagers and employees blamed uh, a series of leukemia cases on that factory. Uh, Mitsubishi has a very large, Mitsubishi Group has a very large role in the Malaysian economy. They are the main uh, foreign multinational in many sectors there. And they ended up deciding to do a big cleanup. They chopped the top off a granite mountain and dug out <clears throat> a trench with um, uh, as a, as a granite sarcophagus and used robots to move 70,000 leaking barrels of low-level radioactive waste into that trench and then covered it again. The cost of that was enormous. It was around 100 million US dollars, even though the revenues, not the profits of that factory during its entire operating life had been less than 100 million dollars. So then you, more recently, there have been more responsible efforts. You had Linus, for example, building an operation at Quanton, $230 million refinery there. But that one had some difficulties and challenges as well in the construction there on the east coast of Malaysia. I did an article about uh, internal documents from that construction process in which Oxo Nobel, of Europe, a Dutch company, one of the world's largest chemical companies, uh, was refusing to provide the fiberglass liners for that operation because they were concerned about the construction quality, uh, bubbles in the concrete and other difficulties. Uh, that site is located in a saltwater coastal marsh that is a main breeding area for fish for the South China Sea, which is one of the world's most productive commercial fisheries. Um, Linus was able to find an alternative uh, Southeast Asian supplier of liners and was able to go ahead with that, uh, with that project and said that it was not a problem. Um, the most recently then you've seen efforts continuing efforts at uh, what is essentially regulatory arbitrage to find jurisdictions that will accept the rare earth processing industry. Don't call it a mining industry, call it a processing, initial processing industry. And you see those uh, now in the United States and elsewhere. The uh, best built mine I've ever seen is Mountain Pass, California. And that is a sad story. A quarter billion dollars in investment in truly state-of-the-art environmental equipment located in a desert, which is far more environmentally resistant and resilient than many of the other locations. Um, and yet there is other than some digging, very little going on there. So when people ask me, what are the possible solutions at some point if the US wants to resume its own production? The obvious answer is whether the federal government can reach an understanding with the California government to reopen fully that facility with end to end uh, production and processing and, and separation of all materials. And that, but that would require some kind of an understanding on California environmental regulations. More likely right now, it looks as though we're gonna end up with regulatory arbitrage in the states with people trying to open uh, facilities in states with less stringent environmental standards. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, my understanding, I'm supposed to do 15 minutes. I would like to uh, hand you over 
to your next speaker, which is Constantine. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. A rather sobering uh, message. And I have to say that in my 30 years uh, doing this in the rare earth industry, I have not had an experience as dramatic as, as you being threatened uh, to be cut up and quartered. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the book that I hope you will write uh, one day. And um, so with that, let me uh, start my presentation and, and share my screen. Um, sorry, should have put it back to the starting slide. There we go. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Constantine Kirianopoulos. I'm the CEO of uh, Neo Performance Materials. Uh, we're a Canadian company listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We're based in Toronto. I live in Toronto, uh, and this is where our headquarters are, and we operate plants around the world. Um, three rare earth plants, two in China, one in Estonia, in Europe, and um, uh, as well as magnetic materials plant. So let me let me get into the presentation and uh, we will. So as a public company, I have to tell you, you can sue me for what I say or my company. Um, so in a nutshell, this is where we fit in the supply chain. We're not a mining company. We, we're just a collection of chemists, chemical engineers, material scientists. Um, we do not mine and we wouldn't know what to do if you gave us a mine. Uh, we buy from mining companies. Um, and I have to say that the types of materials and the types of companies that we buy from uh, do have a, an environmental record that is uh, significantly better than what uh, uh, Keith's experience was in, uh, in South China. Um, we buy from a number of folks in China and outside of China. Uh, and we recently put an arrangement together where we're sourcing raw materials from the United States and I'll elaborate a little later. What we do really is in the middle of this page, um, we buy the raw materials from uh, mining companies, we buy the concentrates in other words, we separate the rare earths individually, but then this is not where we make uh, our money. We make our money by taking those individual rare earths and adding a lot more value by turning them into environmental catalyst uh, con uh, uh, emission control materials that we sell to uh, primarily the automotive sector and perhaps even more importantly we convert those rare earths to rare earth magnetic materials and magnets that we supply around the world um, and we have fairly sustainable uh, revenue growth and profit growth. Uh, our customers are very big names, um, automotive companies, tier one automotive suppliers, electronic uh, producers uh, around the world, who all, I have to say, that uh, all of them have a very high standard of uh, uh, environmental responsibility through their supply chains, and they enforce that standard. So we get audited um, consistently, uh, and we, you know, and I'm sure you would expect me to say that, but we do uh, spend a lot of time and effort uh, on our uh, environmental, social, and governance um, practices and we take those responsibilities uh, seriously. Um, what is unique about our company is that we are the only company in the world that has rare earth value added specialty operations, both in China, which is the largest market for rare earths in the world, but also outside of China, um, we, because we have the only rare earth processing and production facility as well as value added um, uh, materials manufacturing in Estonia serving our, our customers in Europe. The materials that we buy in Estonia come from a, a Russian uh, supplier that has been supplying this plan for the last 20 some odd years. Uh, and they, there is a very good record of responsi responsible uh, care for the materials that they produce. Um, we go further down the supply chain, as I said, we take our rare earths into value added components and more importantly we do make magnetic materials uh, and magnets that we supply to primarily the automotive uh, and electronic industries around the world um, and when you look at our footprint it's um, primarily defined by where our customers are right now uh, more than half of our sales come from asia about a third 
maybe 35%, 37% come from uh, China. Uh, and the vast majority of those sales in China come from global companies who happen to have their largest facilities in China as they try to address um, the Chinese market demand. So this is what we are, this is who we are and what we do. So, you know, my, my thesis today, my, the, the points I wanted to make is that um, the, if we're serious about dealing with uh, climate change, and if we feel that there's something we can do about climate change, that challenge is nothing short of enormous. It's, a, it, it's big and it needs big, bold, ambitious plans to, to deal with it. And of course, the availability of critical materials that will have to, that are indispensable to dealing with energy efficiency, green technology and so on, the availability of those materials becomes a very large issue because there just isn't enough to go around yet. Uh, the ability to produce additional large amounts of the critical materials that we need will become a critical issue to all industrial economies that hope to achieve some form of supply chain independence and supply chain resiliency. Um, the second point I wanted to make is, is, is that we really need to understand how we got here. Uh, and if we don't you know, to, to, to paraphrase rather grossly Carl Sagan, you know, we need to understand the past to, to, to start planning for the future. And, 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 and I, I don't think it's wise to rely on relatively superficial narratives um, that, that point fingers and point to easy solutions. Uh, the problem is very complex. It has taken three, four decades to get to this stage and it will take a lot of resources, money and time and energy to deal with it. And, you know, unfortunately, traditional policy approaches uh, are not going to work. I mean, we've been trying incremental traditional approaches for the last uh, 10, 20 years when we're, uh, unfortunately, we haven't made a lot of progress uh, in the Western world in terms of our uh, supply security and, and independence uh, of those critical materials. Again, without trying to get too sensational, um, a Manhattan Project level type of commitment um, is it, it, it's what it's going to take uh, to get there. Um, and it will involve public, private uh, collaborations. Um, it will involve the attraction of very large, well-capitalized, high ESG companies to enter the sector, which historically has been far too small to attract the likes of Rio and uh, Anglo and, and, and big mining companies um, into the sector. So it, it, we will need to figure out how to do things differently. Uh, and perhaps then we might have a chance to help the, the technologies and the products and the applications develop that will be able to address uh, climate change, decarbonization um, and those related challenges. This is a, a slide that was produced by UBS some time ago. Uh, it's still valid. If anything, it has gotten even more pronounced today. Uh, basically what it says is if we are going to shift from a uh, internal combustion engine world to a full EV type uh, of world, then lithium production needs to go through the roof, literally 3000% you know, increase in production compared to 2017. Lithium is growing, but it's not growing fast enough. In fact, uh, this week, um, uh, a report that was issued by Macquarie uh, Bank in, in Australia predicts a permanent shortage of lithium as the world shifts towards more EVs. Uh, same thing with cobalt. Uh, which has its own challenges, uh, and, and of course, rare earths, not to the same degree, but you know, a rather daunting challenge. Lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel, um, they go into batteries, rare earths and copper go into uh, electric, high efficiency electric motors that will have to be part of the drivetrains uh, and are part of the drivetrains uh, in EVs. Um, and of course, this is the result. Uh, on the left, this is a, an analysis by uh, a very well-regarded, uh, very informed uh, outfit, uh, Adamus Intelligence, uh, run by a, a Canadian chap who re recently returned to Canada. 
uh, Ryan Castillo, who does exhaustive research into EVs and the implications for rare earths. On the left, you have Neodymium Maron Bohr on the rare earth magnet demand for uh, electrified vehicles uh, through the decade. And on the right, um, you have how, how this translates to rare earth needs uh, for those magnets uh, to be produced. If anything, in the last couple of years, things have gotten a bit worse because the trends towards electrification have picked up uh, and they continue to run ahead of whatever projections uh, and assumptions uh, were made a couple of years ago. Um, so let me get into the issue of understanding the last 30 years. Um, China is, you know, uh, everybody's favorite punching bag uh, in terms of uh, its dominance of the rare earth sector. Um, China dominates production, consumption, and the related supply chains. And I would postulate that it leads rare earth production because of its consumption patterns. China will do what China needs to do in order to industrialize, modernize, and expand its middle class. And it has paid serious attention to enabling technologies and enabling materials to allow it to, to, do, uh, to continue to develop its uh, industrial economy. Um, so let's dig through the surface and try to understand what happened and how China uh, did what it did. And, and, and I have to tell you that it is China's demand for rare earths is simply that. It's driven by demand for all the things that need rare earths in, turn, in order to function. And the Chinese government has played a leading role into forming those demand patterns by coming up with the right regulations in order to, intense, to incentivize consumers to switch from internal combustion engines to uh, electric vehicle engines. And you know, as Keith, uh, who is calling from Beijing, knows very well, all you have to do is go for a walk in Beijing. And at least in my case, within five minutes, your eyes start watering because of, of the pollution in the air. The Chinese middle class expects clean air, clean water, and overall clean environment. And as far as um, uh, the state council the, uh, and the Politburo are concerned, they need to deliver those in order to continue with the stability that had promised the, the Chinese uh, people. Um, so it, in China, it's very, very much demand driven. And it's in my experience and in my view, it's always demand that pulls supply, not the other way around. China, the, the Chinese government has and at all levels has played a key role in developing those industrial capabilities. And they have done, you know, what I think you know, they've set an example from which I think we can take a lot of lessons, um, not necessarily lessons on everything, especially the lessons that Keith drew the, uh, the, the parallels to, but there are lessons to be learned. Um, in the latest iteration of the Chinese regulations, and there's new ones coming up over the next couple of weeks, the main driver by the Chinese government, and, and I will repeat a, um, a, pro, a Chinese proverb that the mountains are tall and the emperor is far away, regulating those cowboys that Keith described in, in South China from Beijing, it's near impossible. So every iteration of Chinese regulations have to do with exerting control by Beijing institutions onto the cowboys in the South. That, you know, eventually now the, China, those mines that Keith saw, um, a year or two ago have all been shut down because they were illegal, they were not observing any uh, regulations, um, and they were not paying any taxes. Of course, all of the mines in the Guangdong, Jiangxi, Guangxi area were shut down. And what did the Chinese miners do? Um, they packed up and went across the border to Myanmar and all the heavy rare earth supplies now into China come, come from Myanmar. However, I think it's important to consider that China picks winners and losers, and they're not ashamed to, to admit it. So first, they force the consolidation of the upstream part of the industry, the commodity stuff, the, the mining and the first stage separation, to six state-owned enterprises, 
uh, Beijing, uh, large Beijing-based state-owned enterprises who it's a bit easier to have them follow directives uh, from Beijing, whether it's environmental policy, um, tax, customs, etc. cetera. Um, and these companies are becoming very big players globally. Um, the last point I was going to make, and it is a bit related to what Keith was saying earlier, that you know, in the 90s, rare earth production was dominated by Rompulanc in France, in La Rochelle, where they were importing monazite with a bit of radioactivity in it. And they ran into all kinds of issues with disposing the, the, radio, the radioactive thorium post-processing. And eventually they, shut, they had to shut down and they switched to importing rare earths from China to continue their processing and eventually discontinued all of their rare earth processing uh, and moved it to, to China. Uh, primarily for cost reasons. And of course, Molycorp um, in Mountain Pass uh, has shut down a few times. And back in the uh, mid 90s was a very major producer of rare earths. And it went out of business. It, it shut down in, two, in 1990, in the mid 90s. And China picked up the slack both from Rompulank and from Molycorp without missing a beat. Um, all the Chinese programs and the massive investments in capacity and know-how, all the R&D institutes producing uh, rare earth engineers, working on applications and continuing to come up with better processes, lower cost processes to, uh, to apply rare earths uh, have had the result that the bulk of the know-how today resides in China. Uh, and then there's, score, there's of course a few exceptions like Neil uh, and a few other small companies here and there uh, that do command, uh, you know, a significant part of the IP uh, pie. Let me turn a little bit to supply chains, how and how, why supply chains come together. This is a, a chart that I like. I've used it before by Scott Madden. Um, and perhaps to make it a bit more, to, to, to draw the parallel to something that's perhaps a bit uh, more um, accessible, uh, I would point out that a lot of the principles um, outlined by uh, Scott Madden uh, have to do uh, with what, what was outlined in Michael Porter's uh, 1989 book, The Competitive Advantage of Nations. And if you read through the lines, I mean, you can see how supply chains can very effectively come together. Supply chains are uh, rational um, entities. They come together driven by demand. Um, and as long as you have a customer that's willing to pay for what you do and forces you to innovate, that continues to pull um, your suppliers and their suppliers uh, along and so on. Um, eventually, properly structured supply chains, um, if, 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 if they're done right, they are very efficient um, entities and um, they, they can earn sustainable growth rates as well as uh, cash flows. So let me turn a little bit to the automotive sector. And again, I'll try to relate it back to uh, what China is doing in, uh, in this sector. Um, I think it's very important that to understand that the Chinese regulators and the policymakers are extremely effective students of history. And in my experience, they have absolutely learned from whatever mistakes uh, they have um, committed. And they, I haven't seen them commit the same mistake twice. Um, and that's, that's very important. They learn from the experience of, of the West and they make very rational decisions. Um, so a year ago, January of 2020, a year and a half ago rather, uh, there was an article in the Financial Times by the National Platform on Future Mobility which was a collection of uh, automotive industry executives and tier one uh, suppliers to those uh, automotive uh, producers, uh, executives, uh, that came up with a study that said, if um, it, by the year 2030, as we continue towards transitioning from internal combustion engines to EVs, Germany will lose 400,000 jobs. And the reason for that is, first of all, um, EVs are simpler to put together. They don't have as many moving parts. So you physically don't need as many people to put them together, regardless of automation and robots and so on. But second, and perhaps more important, the current, at that time, a year ago, a year and a half ago, 
all the value added components for EVs, namely the electric motors as part of the drivetrains and the batteries were all coming from China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, and that's really where the value added production was as far as the EV supply chains were concerned. Uh, and that's in Germany and uh, subsequently Europe made the decision that that had to change. Uh, when I look at what China is doing, and right now, as you can see from this chart, China is dominating the EV industry. They're the biggest producer and it's the biggest market. And they've had a 10 year jump uh, on this uh, and the rest of the world is trying to catch up. But Europe is doing all the things right. And, and I hope tomorrow we'll hear from uh, Roland Gauss, who's uh, with the uh, EIT, uh, a think tank within the EU that helps formulate policy. Uh, as to what uh, Europe has done. But um, the, the other point I wanted to make here is that Chinese planners understand that there isn't a single post second world war economy that has industrialized and developed without automotive being a key pillar of that economy. So China kind of missed the internal combustion engine wave, but they're absolutely determined to dominate the EV wave. And to that extent, you see Chinese companies, private and not so private, around the world making key investments in companies that are producing lithium, producing cobalt, and have a chance to producing rare earths. You know, I don't know how things will play out. I have, a, I would put better than 50-50 odds uh, on China having access to the material that it needs to continue its march towards full electrification of its transportation sector. We'll see how it plays out. Um, this is what I was talking about in, in terms of what Europe is doing. Um, it, after the uh, article that I mentioned, they came up with uh, the European Battery Alliance. They committed 2.9 billion euros, expecting that the 2.9 billion in public money will attract something in the order of 9 billion of private capital that will invest uh, in European battery supply chains. Well, fast forward um, a year and a half later, and it looks like Europe has managed to attract all the big names in the battery space. And they're all building gigafactories that will feed into the uh, automotive uh, manufacturing in Europe. Um, and you know they, they're not discriminating as to where these EV, EVs battery manufacturers come from. I mean, you look at the list, CATL, the biggest battery producer in the world is a Chinese company. SK Innovation and Samsung are, and LG are Korean companies. Panasonic is Japanese, but, and, and Northvolt is now becoming the largest European producer, but the, the European Union is absolutely determined to capture these value added jobs by securing the supply chains that feed into automotive. And now they're turning their attention to rare earths and rare earth magnets because those are key parts of the drivetrains. Uh, and they're putting together something very similar in terms of the European Raw Materials Alliance or IRMA. So where, you know, perhaps instead of just spending all the time on, on problems and learning lessons, perhaps we can start thinking about where we go from here. And, you know, I'm not a mining person. I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. I, I love to understand how things work and, and put molecules together to make them do really cool things. But mining is a fact of life and is in this, an indispensable part of life. And when we talk mining, perhaps what we really should be talking about is resource availability. Resources will have to come from primary mining, secondary, you know, urban mining, recycling, as well as byproduct um, utilization. Um, and, and I will elaborate on that. Uh, however, you know, the, the level as, as if we believe the slides that I showed earlier, the level of mining output, both primary as well as secondary will need to be orders of magnitude greater than what it is. I, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. Um, I'm, I'd like to believe in the in the positive uh, side of, uh, of human nature. And I would expect, I, I'm quite encouraged by the pressures that I've been seeing the last couple of years in terms of ESG, um, huge trends. Um, and, and in conversations with friends of mine who are in the mining industry, 
um, they, they take ESG extremely seriously. Uh, ESG is probably the biggest trend in resource extraction, both in terms of customer expectations, as well as in investor, investor expectations. Um, we'll see how it unfolds, but my sense is that as, as you start dealing with larger types of uh, mining output, um, and technological changes, I think we're getting closer to a mining behavior that's a lot more responsible than some of the examples that we've seen in the front pages uh, of newspapers uh, in the past few years. Um, speaking of secondary mining, uh, let me allow me to make a bit of a commercial for what uh, we recently announced uh, last week, in fact, NEO uh, and uh, energy fuels in the United States. And you know, there's a very large uh, amount of production of a byproduct mineral around the world that is known as monazite. This is the monazite that Ron Poulenc uh, used to uh, process in France that they had to abandon because of the reactivity challenges. Um, there is, um, you know, very as I said, there's large amounts of monazite being produced as byproducts of other. Uh, mining operations for titanium and, and zirconium and so on in Australia, Africa, and the United States. Well, uh, energy fuels, uh, the, uh, I believe the only vertically integrated uranium producer in the United States um, has a deal with Kimors, a mining company and titanium producer in the United States. Uh, in Georgia, and the byproduct monazite, so again, byproduct means zero mining cost, something that the Chinese have uh, enjoyed over the last 30 years as the bulk of their rare earth production comes from byproducts, uh, byproduct mining in uh, Inner Mongolia for the extraction of uh, iron for stainless steel production. So energy fuels is buying monazite from Kimors, it is brought to Utah to their mill where the uranium is extracted for sales to their energy uh, customers, energy production customers. The thorium is put into their thousand year tailings and the rare earths, we, we work together with them to come up with a flow sheet that extracts the rare earths in a form that is uh, completely benign and it's suitable uh, for us to feed into our uh, rare earth processing plant in uh, Estonia. So it's been a long time since the uh, supply chain originated in the United States and processed in, uh, in Europe uh, had taken place. So um, we, we jumped all over this uh, opportunity because it does have a, a real chance of being both economically and uh, environmentally uh, resilient and sustainable. So I've, I've been talking long enough before uh, Sophia uh, puts the hook on me. Um, let me summarize. Um, you know, we, we can't uh, neglect the fact that supply chains come together as a result of customer demand. You can rule them in, you cannot rule them into existence. You cannot go along the assumption that if you build it, they will come. It works in Hollywood, but it probably doesn't work in, in the real world. If you have customers willing to buy what you make, then CEOs like me can go to our board to justify investing in that supply chain. Uh, but if the demand isn't there, the risk associated with capital investment in this sector is, 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 is too big and perhaps unacceptable. Um, Long-term industrial policy is absolutely essential, and you need governments, well-informed uh, governments with well-thought-through policies to work with industry, especially the largest, better capitalized uh, companies around the world, to put these supply chains together. Again, driven by demand, and then the, every aspect and every node in the supply chain backfills in order to fill that demand. And, the, and what I said, long-term, long-term is essential because the sector is dominated by Chinese state-owned enterprises. Chinese state-owned enterprises are part of the stuff. You know, they, they follow the guidelines and the uh, directive um, from uh, the Chinese State Council. So they operate on five-year plans and actually their investment horizon is a lot longer than that. They have terribly low cost of capital. Um, and, and if you're, a public company CEO that has to rely on capital markets, 
you're never going to, to match the cost of capital the Chinese SOEs have. And also the expectation on return on that capital. Uh, they can operate at margins that are much, much lower than the margins that private you know, companies like, like ours would need in order to, uh, to provide a proper return on that capital. Finally, it's a big problem and it needs a big, ambitious, uh, audacious, hairy solution. Um, if again, you know, leave, leaving aside um, the specific considerations of rare earths, I mean, it, it is a small industry uh, and we managed to carve out a niche uh, that we can do what we do well and we can, we can be profitable. Um, however, the, if we're going to be dealing with decarbonization because of climate change and we need to deal with that, you know, nothing short of a Manhattan style Manhattan Project style uh, commitment or an Apollo mission um, is going to, uh, to succeed. So I think governments and industry need to start thinking about the implications of how humanity, how the world is going to deal with big problems and um, get ready to come up with rational solutions. Geopolitics, uh, trade wars and so on, can provide impediments to, to this execution. Uh, decoupling uh, could be, again, another impediment, but you know, perhaps we can have a longer conversation about whether decoupling makes sense and B, whether it's possible, uh, but that's a different conversation for a different time. So with that, uh, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you for your attention. And I'd like to pass it on to, uh, to Rod Egger uh, from the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, for an enlightening presentation. Thank you. All right, well, Constantine, thank you very much uh, for the handover and thank you to both you and uh, Keith uh, for setting the stage for my presentation. Let me share my screen. Here we go, and with a little bit of luck, now you see uh, my title slide. Is that correct? You're all set, Red. Rod, ready all to go. All right. Okay. So we've heard uh, up until now a lot about rare earths and a lot about China, which are certainly important in this discussion. Uh, I want to turn and talk about public policy, uh, but, but from a somewhat broader perspective that's beyond rare earths. Uh, to other critical materials uh, and beyond, but including uh, China. Uh, my purpose is not to suggest particular policies, uh, but rather to try to frame the discussion. Let me say at the outset that these are personal views. This is my version of the forward-looking statement slide. Uh, I feel it's necessary to say this because uh, I am affiliated with something called the Critical Materials Institute, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, these are my views, not the views of the Department of Energy or uh, the Colorado School of Mines with respect to public policy. So the central question of my paper and my presentation uh, is as follows. What kind of public policy should the United States and other market economies have toward rare earths and other critical materials. Uh, I include the tagline, a user perspective, uh, because if we think about uh, the title critical mineral or critical material or strategic material, this is very much a perspective of the, the users of the materials, whether they are manufacturers, uh, industries within an economy or, or final end users. Uh, so it's a user perspective uh, that focuses on, on risks, risks to short to medium term availability of materials, uh, and, and as well risks to longer term availability of these raw materials. And because this deals with risk, uh, another way of asking my question is, whose responsibility is it to provide insurance, the insurance against these risks to short-term uh, availability or longer-term longer availability. And, and, 
And Constantine uh, alluded to the, the, the trade-off here, and, uh, which I describe as the cost efficiencies of geographic fragmentation versus supply chain risks. And the idea is that we've seen the globalization and in many cases, fragmentation geographically of supply chains uh, over the last 50 or 60 years, uh, because it now is possible to locate specific stages of the supply chain uh, in those locations where costs are lowest. Whereas 50 or 70 years ago, uh, by and large, mining was in proximity to the processing all of which was in geographic proximity to the, uh, to the end users. If you think about steel production uh, 50 years ago in the United States or Europe, uh, the steel production uh, was supplied by uh, reasonably locally sourced uh, iron ore, metallurgical coal, limestone, and other important inputs. But over the last 50 to 70 years, transportation costs have fallen. Uh, decreasing the importance of proximity. Uh, in addition, uh, information uh, technologies and the ability to coordinate activities uh, across large distances uh, has vastly improved, which means that supply chains can be fragmented. Uh, but with that, with those low costs come supply chain risks, which can be both short-term and long-term uh, in nature. And, and so should the private sector be responsible to provide the insurance? What role should government play in providing insurance? Uh, and in turn, what form of insurance? Let me organize the rest of my comments around the following expression, uh, a false dichotomy and seven levers of power. So I think there's a false dichotomy in discussions of public policy about critical minerals and materials. And instead, there's a messier middle ground, which uh, is a little bit like Dante's seven uh, circles of hell, except it's the seven levers of policy. And I don't say that to imply that policy is always hell, but rather that getting public policy right is challenging. So here's the false dichotomy in many discussions about uh, critical raw materials. Uh, some argue, let's let the market decide. Uh, and on the other hand, we have picking winners and losers uh, or undertake industrial policy in what I would describe as a simple-minded way. Uh, and you're in one camp or the other, uh, and they are mutually exclusive and far distant from one another. While it's a I think this is a false dichotomy, but they do help focus these, the, the aspects of each of these uh, extreme views help focus our attention, I think, on what is important. So let the market decide. What's, what's the idea here? Uh, a national uh, let the market decide approach is sector agnostic. Uh, let the market determine where uh, the best what the best allocation of capital should be. Limit government activities to legal and regulatory frameworks, uh, focus on minimal but efficient regulation of commercial activities. Uh, in terms of supply chain risk, uh, manufacturers and end users are in the best position to manage their supply chain risks. Uh, leave it to the manufacturers and end users to figure out where their risks are. Uh, what is the magnitude of risk and what are the what's the best set of approaches to manage these risks? The exception in, in this caricature of policy discussion, national security. Uh, clearly, there are military and essential civilian uses of the material uh, that governments have an appro appropriate role uh, to, 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 to evaluate and manage. The other caricature is, is industrial policy, picking winners or losers, uh, favor selected domestic industries because they are important for one reason or another. Uh, a number of policy tools are, are often proposed, international trade restriction, tax incentives, subsidies, other things. Uh, a key, I would say, 
vision or, or uh, characteristic of this uh, caricature uh, is that government bears some responsibility to assist the private sector and end users in managing their supply chain risks. Now, I say this is a false dichotomy because uh, the United States, Japan, the European nations, all, it's, it's a combination of both. And so the real question is not let the market decide or pursue industrial policy, but rather what's the appropriate mix of, of market uh, and policy solutions uh, to the challenge at hand. And so here are my seven levers of policy uh, in this mess messier middle ground between uh, let the market decide and pick winners and losers. So uh, number one, internalize externalities. And by that, I mean uh, environmental externalities and promote equity or fairness. Uh, this is, a, I think, broadly accepted rule for government. It doesn't apply specifically to critical materials, so I'm not going to spend any more time on this. Uh, second, focus on education and basic research. Focus, in other words, government activities on those things that the market uh, by itself will likely underprovide from the perspective of society as a whole. Note that this is still sector agnostic. Third, and getting slightly more uh, interventionist, prioritize education and research in strategic sectors or technologies, whether they be for uh, military and national defense purposes, uh, with respect to uh, meeting the challenges of net zero by 2050, or, or some other uh, grand societal challenge. Getting even more interventionist, and, and I would say more specialized, but to me, uh, getting to the sweet spot, if you will, of uh, policy towards critical materials, uh, think about focusing R&D on bridging the gap between basic research and, and, and research that's necessary to scale up and fully deploy a technology. Too often discussions of public policy, in my view, uh, consider basic research and, and, and industry research as two mutually exclusive, uh, far separated, uh, much different types uh, of research activity. The one, uh, that is clearly a public good, uh, the other which should be uh, fully funded by the private sector. But there's a, there's a messier middle ground uh, that is necessary to take an idea that is, is promising at a laboratory scale uh, and evaluate it at progressively larger scales with, with more realistic heterogeneous uh, materials uh, to determine whether and at what cost uh, this technology will be uh, deployable and commercially successful. Uh, and I might notice that items two, three, and four on this list, if we think about research, really uh, focus on innovation as a solution to supply chain risks. It's really a longer term focus or approach towards towards uh, assuring the availability of the raw materials necessary to meet, for example, the, the challenges of the energy transition. Uh, but many argue that, 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 that innovation by itself uh, is too slow. It will take too long a time and we need solutions more urgently and becoming even more interventionist. Uh, the, the proposal that we use commercial policy to achieve results sooner than relying on technology alone. And this could involve a variety of things, uh, public, private, public private uh, uh, management of working inventories or strategic stockpiles of, of uh, critical raw materials or loan guarantees uh, to incentivize, incentivize new activities. Uh, government offtake agreements to provide a minimum uh, essential market uh, for a market that will attract 
uh, pri further private investment or government commercial investments that represent full funding or partial funding uh, of, of activities throughout the supply chain. Uh, JOGMEC, the Japan Oil, Gas and Metals National Corporation is an example uh, that is often cited here. Six, and getting beyond purely domestic policy, uh, go beyond pursuing multi multilateral solutions uh, through the WTO, uh, but pursue bilateral adjustments to trade uh, when that is viewed as a significant uh, impediment to assuring supply chains. And my seventh, uh, my seventh aspect or lever uh, or opportunity in this messier middle ground, work with allied nations. The uh, no country uh, will be, should aspire to be self-sufficient uh, in all aspects of these critical raw material supply chains, uh, international efforts, in addition to, to national efforts uh, are essential uh, and need to be evaluated. So these are my seven levers uh, of policy, my, my, my analog to uh, Dante's seven circles of hell. Let me finish by simply giving you my personal biases, and they are biases. Uh, first of all, I'm an economist, uh, so, so I have to, you know, I, I'm, I'm wired to believe that the market does amazing things, but it's not the caricature of a market economy that, that often is used to describe economists and their uh, uh, attraction to the market, so not the caricature. Uh, consider policies carefully in this messier middle ground. The two that give me most pause are the commercial policy approach, uh, which runs the risk of the unintended uh, consequences of commercial policy that favors specific companies as opposed to specific sectors or favors specific uh, technologies, you know, the lithium ion battery, uh, as opposed to technology uh, areas, batteries and energy storage generally. And I'm also not a big fan of using trade policy uh, and restrictions on international trade, more specifically to assure supply chains. Uh, the challenge, and here uh, my final comment, uh, the key challenge to me is identifying the social goals, for example, net zero by 2050, that the market by itself is not pursuing or not pursuing with the urgency that society needs, and then determining how to, to, to mix and optimal or balance private and public activities. And, and I think this necessarily, because public-private partnerships are challenging to execute uh, effectively. There's going to be experimentation. Uh, they will be messy. Uh, but we learn from fall, small experiments. So that then is my false dichotomy and seven levers of policy on the broader topic of public policy toward rare earths and other critical materials. With that, thank you for your kind attention. Let me stop sharing uh, and turn it over to Chris Barry. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rod, and thank you, Sophia, Jed, and, and Keith and Constantine. I have uh, quite a task ahead of me, I think, in trying to uh, follow uh, what has been some really, really interesting data. So with that, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and uh, share my screen. I just have a few slides prepared. Um, go ahead and maximize this, oops. There we go. Okay. So again, I think my, my remarks over the next 10 or 15 minutes are not quite as rare earth focused, uh, talking a little bit this evening, um, maybe a little bit more about the battery or about lithium or some of the other critical materials. But regardless of what I talk about, uh, a lot of the themes that we have heard about tonight in terms of policy, whether or not it's public private 
or just a lot of the challenges for industrial policy here in the United States, I think run through this presentation as well. So just a very brief intro about myself. i uh, been involved in financial markets for about the last 24 years, primarily based in New York City. Recently relocated to Washington, D.C. Uh, with the family and for about the last 10 or 11 years now have focused as an independent analyst and an advisor on battery metal supply chains. So thinking very hard about supply, about demand, about pricing, and how all of these different industries, whether or not it's clean tech, automotive, energy, what have you, are supposed to uh, shift their business models, if that's the right way to think about it, um, really seamlessly in the next coming decades. It's gonna be a Herculean task, which is something I think we've heard a lot about uh, over the course of the remarks this evening. And so I just wanted to touch on how I sort of see the, the battery supply chain evolving and some of the problems and some of the opportunities as we really try and electrify. So speaking of electrification, I think one of the ways that you wanna think about raw material demand and security of supply is in terms of just how much we're going to need to hit even relatively conservative EV or electric vehicle penetration rates. Uh, as I'm sure everyone on the call is, is familiar with the movie Jaws and, and Roy Schneider, when he sees the shark says, we're gonna need a bigger boat. I guess my view from the raw material perspective is again, even to hit relatively conservative EV penetration rates of say, I don't know, 10% EV penetration by 2025, you're going to need orders of magnitude, more lithium, more cobalt, more rare earths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is an enormous shock to a number of systems out there. And so some of the major battery metals market themes that I think we're all struggling with, but investors in particular are trying to balance uh, are listed here. Number one, while there is obviously a huge demand shock that I think we're in the early stages of undergoing, um, whether or not, again, it's lithium or cobalt, those are, the, I think, two of the most popular. A, you know, the major producers like Albemarle, like Glencore have read the tea leaves, so to speak. And so there is a wave of pretty substantial capacity set to come on stream in the next three or four or five years from these major producers. Uh, that scares a lot of investors because of course it implies the threat of overcapacity in what is an inherently violently cyclical mining business. And I think my view is that when you have a situation where for years lithium demand grew at five to 6% per year, and now all of a sudden it's growing at 20% per year. And I'm very confident in thinking that that's going to continue certainly through the middle of this decade and arguably to 2030, the question is, can supply keep up? It doesn't mean that it won't overshoot occasionally, but I think the question is, how do you equilibrate supply and demand for these small markets when we've never seen this kind of a demand shock? That's number one. Number two, I feel like every week there's another OEM that's coming out with their own battery day, their own EV penetration, promising to spend 30 or $35 billion on vehicle electrification. So again, from the bullish sort of narrative or perspective, this is not just a Tesla story anymore, certainly not here in the West. Um, and I think I've, I've got some data that can kind of run through that. As Constantine mentioned, I believe, you know, ESG, especially on the mining side, really is the top priority. Um, this is not something that it's going to fade away, partially because governments, I think, are mandating it. But more importantly than that, I think consumers are mandating it. And so I think one of the real challenges for critical metals miners is how do you measure ESG? And specifically, how do you measure the E and the S and then the G? I don't think there's a specific standard out there that the industry has agreed upon. So, you know, it's a really challenging uh, goal to aspire to. Obviously, enormous government stimulus. We read about this every day. Again, I'm here in Washington, D.C. So, you know, a lot is, is coming down the pipe. But this, again, is not just a North American or even just a United States story. Almost anywhere in the world, whether or not it's because of COVID, because of the U.S.-China trade war, what have you, the idea of a more resilient, 
uh, closer to home supply chain that focuses on this idea of green growth, I think is, is well underway. And so, you know, the question becomes if we're really going to ramp capacity for these critical metals and these critical materials, and I think Constantine did a really good job of, of talking about how a lot of these metals aren't actually mined, they're produced, they're chemically processed, and that is a real challenge for the industry to scale. And so, you know, I think it's going to take more virgin mined material to obviously hit these goals around electrification of the economy, but you are going to have to see technologies like recycling, like direct lithium extraction, which is effectively a more cost-effective, uh, more environmentally friendly way to produce lithium from brine, cathode and anode development, or, or battery swapping, things that have actually been tried in the past to try and ramp capacity while at the same time keeping a lid on carbon emissions. That is the real sort of paradox and the challenge here, I think. So just to look at some numbers, I know, you know, for those of you on the East Coast, maybe it's a little bit late, so we won't, we won't go into, into too much detail here. Um, but, you know, production capacity on a lithium carbonate equivalent basis, as I mentioned before, is going to expand rather dramatically. Um, whether or not that matches this 20% demand growth rate remains to be seen. Um, again, Albemarle, SQM, and Livent, kind of the big three North American, or I should say North and South American, Lithium producers have, have made their intentions very clear. Um, Chinese producers, again, bringing more on stream. And the question I think that the, the, in, the lithium uh, business and in particular the battery business is struggling with right now is not so much, can we bring more lithium on stream? That is a given, I think that can happen, but can we bring more sustainably sourced battery grade lithium on stream to the tune of a, the situation where today we are at 370,000 tons of lithium production globally. Uh, that is going to triple to about a million tons of demand by 2025. And then my own view is that doubles again to 2 million tons of demand by 2020. Again, all predicated on wider electrification of the economy and also EV adoption. But just to give everybody an idea of, of what that means and the shock to the system, this is just for one of these critical elements, never mind the cobalt or the rare earths. You can see at the bottom, for us to get to a million tons of demand, lithium demand by 2025 and have supply match that, it's going to require around 125,000 tons of new lithium capacity every single year between now and 2025. And Traditionally, lithium mines, because of capital expenditure constraints and, and just the size of the market, were really sized and scaled to around 30,000 tons of production per year. So you're looking at the potential addition of necessity, I should say, of four new lithium mines every year out over the next four, four or five years. And the real challenge is that you don't just sort of snap your fingers or flick a switch and bring this capacity on. A new Greenfields lithium mine can take you anywhere from seven to 10 years to come on stream. And that has everything to do with permitting and exploration and development and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is not a, a given, certainly not from the raw material side of things. Again, Auto manufacturers are all in on electric vehicles. You do not have to search very hard to find ample evidence of not really even just gigawatt scale growth, but if you believe Tesla, terawatt scale growth. Um, it looks like what's happening is again, across borders, whether or not it's here in North America or Europe, you are seeing joint ventures, uh, General Motors and LG here in the United States, Stellantis last week talking about three factories in the United States and a couple more in Europe, Ford, SK Innovation, the list goes on and on. Again, I would just draw your attention to the forecast scale of the growth of this industry today at around 270 gigawatt hours of battery capacity, lithium ion battery capacity, really growing arguably to between seven and eight times its existing size today by 2030. So it's, again, it's not just a lithium story. This goes well beyond uh, lithium into other raw materials as well. And so the question is not where it's going to come from, but how do we produce enough raw material in time and do so sustainably where we're minimizing 
carbon emissions. That's really the challenge. This, of course, is why a lot of all of the EV manufacturers or the traditional internal combustion engine manufacturers are excited. Um, some of this data is lumpy, but regardless of whether or not you're in China or the United States or the European Union, you're seeing what they call in the financial markets, lower left to upper right growth, which means basically EV sales on a month over month and the year over year basis are increasing, right? And we all know this uh, off of a very low base to be fair, but nevertheless, this is pretty broad growth. This is one of the things that has everybody excited in particular last year, I think during COVID when much of the global economy was frozen, you really saw EV sales explode over the course of the year, which was something I don't think a lot of people uh, thought were thought would happen. And then finally, or two more things, and then I'll, I'll finish up here. But, you know, as we have chatted about uh, earlier, the government stimulus fire hose, as, as I like to call it, or the bazooka, is on, okay? And again, I think this has a lot to do with the US-China trade war. It obviously has a lot to do with what we learned about supply chains from COVID. But of course, a lot of this backdrop or is, is very supportive of this idea of green growth, okay? So whether or not it's here in the United States, the European Union laying out its own Green New Deal, there is a lot of money that is going to be sprayed along the supply chain in the coming years. I do think there are questions to be answered about how it's allocated optimally and efficiently, so it's not wasted. But nevertheless, I think the government stimulus sort of narrative here is, is really powerful and, and really um, something that, again, consumers are pushing for. And so finally, again, if you believe my thesis on, on the really, really sustainably strong demand uh, for the raw materials, you know, what, what is the solution? Absent mining more material, which I think I've indicated we're going to have to do. Uh, can some of the technologies that I mentioned before, can recycling, can direct lithium extraction technology, battery swapping, cathode nano development, can they save us? Can they fill what could be a structural raw material gap and keep a lid on carbon emissions? And I think this was actually alluded to in one of the other presentations. My, my view is, at least in the interim, the answer is no, but they can certainly help. Uh, recycling, direct lithium extraction, a lot of these technologies were perhaps viable in a different resource environment or a different resource market. Uh, recycling actually always has had an economic problem. Uh, the recovery rates were too low. Lithium pricing was too low. That fortunately is starting to change, but I don't think you're going to see a lot of supply, recycled supply coming on stream, at least in the lithium business before 2028 to 2030. So again, it opens up this question of what we do between now and then to manage this gap. Similar for direct lithium extraction and battery swapping technology, there's just a lot of questions around these economics of these processes given the relatively small markets. So, you know, when I think about this whole process and this whole thematic around electrification and of course, raw material security of supply. I think about it in terms of the four Ds, decarbonization, decoupling, cost deflation, and demand. And we didn't really get into cost deflation tonight with respect to battery prices falling. But you know, I think it's actually really, really positive that technology and capital are moving faster now than certainly pre-COVID and arguably ever before towards decarbonization, towards these goals, whether or not it's 2040, 2050, or 2060. And again, I think at the end of the day, battery economics, that, that cost crash, that deflationary cost crash is just so, so powerful and very, very hard to stop. Um, again, governments with the stimulus and also with legislation, I think realize that supply chain dependencies are bad for business. They're bad for the tax base. They're bad for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so I do think you are going to see some sort of selective decoupling, whether or not it's medical equipment or around critical materials, start to happen. And you know, Constantine's work with energy fuels, I think, is is the first of what I hope are a number of of examples that we see over the coming years. Um, and you know, again, with that, I just think that we're having going to have to find a balance here, and the balance is between dramatically ramping supply for lithium, 
cobalt, rare earths. Again, it sort of goes down the list with the reality that, you know, carbon neutrality is going to be a really, really, really challenging goal to attain. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go after it, but I do think that the solution, and this is one thing that Rod really focused on, has to do with research and development, okay? This is absolutely required, whether or not it's a mixture of public and private partnerships, but I do think that leveraging technologies that are already existing today is probably the best path forward to achieving these goals and electrifying society throughout the course of the coming decades. So with that, I will go ahead and step aside again. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone at Caltech and thank you to my fellow panelists for a really, really interesting discussion. And Sophia, I think I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say, I mean, this has been an amazing conversation and I'm going to open it. To, I'm going to read some of the questions that have been submitted, but I just want to point out to a couple, if everybody could just turn on their cameras now so we could see you perfect um so keith kind of shocked us putting us into uh this this the, the bringing out all the environmental uh concerns of course and also the how unregulated it you know it may have been and how much has changed after china stepped in to start regulating the the industry also for reasons of uh, like the ones that you that you've mentioned, but um, I, there are a couple of things I want to just throw out there so we can you know people should jump in and 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 answer. I hear the state like the state. We love to hate the state. Um, we criticize China for really being able to use both the power of the state and its market and the market and the private sector. Uh, in a, it's a it's a delicate song and dance, but it but it's done it pretty successfully. Uh, Europe also has a tradition of of being able to um, work with both. Uh, the biggest problem is the United States that doesn't want to admit how much. Had it not been for COVID, my big question is how much would the state have stepped in? Is there uh, does this mean that we need to really? you know, think it through. Do we want to be more like China? Do we want to be more like the European Union? Uh, the United States really doesn't want to be like anybody. Uh, so I think that there is this issue. And the other issue that I think is, is huge, and especially in, when, when uh, Chris was describing how much material we need, are we really serious about climate? I mean, Constantine raised that question. Are we serious about decarbonizing the economy. Uh, and we need a Manhattan Project. And even though it seems like we're throwing so much money at the problem and we're giving, you know, globally, uh, there are just so many moving parts and so many things have to happen at the same time. Are we even doing enough? And do we have, um, do we really have a narrative? Do we really have the urgency? Uh, do we really show, are we demonstrating through our policies, uh, the urgency? And then of course, these questions that, uh, I mean, Keith wrote, I just wanted to touch upon that. Keith, you wrote an article about China's EV production and how many strides it's already made, if I'm not mistaken, no, recent, recently. So, you know, China is, as Constantine also said, it's, it's already, it has a lead. Um, does anyone want to touch upon these, Keith? I'll jump in on that. Uh, I think that China's industrial policies in rare earths have been uh, very effective in making China not only the dominant producer, but also the dominant producer of a lot of downstream materials. Mm -hmm. um, and I should jump in, I should mention also, I, I should emphasize this more in my original remarks, that they have been making very drastic efforts to crack down on a lot of the, uh, the organized crime elements in Southern China to the point that actually uh, you had an announcement a few years ago by the premier actually came about three or four weeks after my story on the people threatening to carve me up like an animal slaughterhouse. Uh, there was an announcement of a national security campaign um, by police agencies, which actually then unfortunately was, uh, and then got criticized by human rights organizations for excessive uh, 
police tactics uh, towards some of these organized crime groups. But the point is that uh, downstream industries have been moving to China because they had trouble getting, knowing that they truly had reliable to rare earth metals elsewhere. And you can see that, for example, in LED manufacturing. A lot of LED companies moved there. I went to a factory uh, that was uh, that had switched LED production because I, I think it was europium that they needed. Um, and uh, they just concluded that it made more sense to be in, uh, in China than, than in California. So what is happening now in electric cars? Electric cars are vastly more important, obviously, as Constantine rightly said, than anything else we've been talking about. The car industry, for example, in China is 6% of GDP. A lot of people think of China as a, an economy that is heavily dependent on exports to the United States, but exports to the United States are about 4% of GDP, and about half of that 4% is imported content. So the net value to the Chinese economy is about 2% of GDP. By contrast, the car industry, 6% of GDP, and it's almost 100% localized. And so that's a very big, important part of the, of the economy. In, in the United States, it's slightly larger. Where are we going to get, end up getting our cars? I think that China has, has shown that just as it had a long-term program in rare earths to uh, dominate the production and then dominate downstream in industries, they also have a very clear focused policy on electric cars. So you saw starting in 2007, Premier Wen Jiabao articulated a very clear vision that they had to be dominant in electric cars. Uh, they had a target initially of a half million cars a year, and they totally missed it. So this is, this is as Constantine talks about, they do make mistakes, but they've corrected and adjusted it. So they had that target, uh, I think it was by 2012 or so, and they didn't come close. But they have had a consistent policy of pursuing this, and not only pursuing the assembly, but also the subsystem. So now you look at it, and China is 60 to 80 percent of world production of battery materials. Uh, excuse me, 60 to 80% of battery chemicals, 60 to 80% of uh, uh, battery anodes, and 60 to 80% of global production of electric motors. So it not only has the ability to make the cars and the designers to make the, the to assemble the cars, but it also has the ability and dominance really of the subsystems. So if people talk about an Apollo program, um, but it almost, that term almost gets used too often. The biggest question in the United States is whether there can be consistent policy. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon that runs over the course of decades and in which China has a 15 year head start. So, how you catch up with a 15 year head start is going to be very tough uh, to the extent that, for example, uh, government authorizations as opposed to, you then need the actual budgetary authority, but, uh, but you actually, actually then need the outlays to be approved, but, but you really need long-term consistent policies as much as possible that you can lock in place for 10 years and try to avoid uh, the sort of zigzags of administration to administration uh, policy. I'd, I'd like to ask for one minute, Rod, do you think that, that we've reached the point now that the US, the policy world uh, across the aisles has really decided that, you know, yes, we're going to electrify the transportation sector, or would it be that in two years, we, you know, there's a change of of hands in Congress and we go back, do you think like that the, the conventional motor will come back and EV, there will be a de-incentivization of this EV uh, transition? My short answer is that I think in the United States, uh, focus on raw material supply chains uh, and commitment to electric vehicles is a train that has left the station. On both, in both areas, there's been a momentum developing over the last decade or so, uh, maybe quietly behind the scenes and not evident to, to the general public, uh, that to some degree is independent of the party in power. 
uh, there was a significant amount of federal U.S. Uh, thinking about critical raw materials motivated uh, importantly by the, the rare earths scare uh, a decade or so ago that kicked into action uh, R&D activities related to rare earths, but also other critical raw materials that became more visible uh, and accelerated and expanded uh, over the last year or so, partly because of the change of administrations, but partly partly because of COVID, but it was happening uh, in the background uh, all over an extended period of time. So this is baked into the system. I mean, we are really, in fact, transitioning, and there's no turning back the clock. Yes. OK. Uh, does anybody else want to chime in on this? I want to say that, that uh, three of the questions that we have uh, were related to the to Keith's uh, description of the rare earths uh, incident in China, um, but we do have a question that uh, where uh, we're asked of whether we think that that demand is primarily constraining the U.S. rare earth industry or the supply. What is the problem? I mean, Mountain Pass is back in the game. It has gotten DoD contracts. It, is, it has a plan to move beyond mining uh, to processing, separation and processing. Uh, is, is this something that's viable, not for the, only for the specific uh, co company, but just generally, are we seeing a shift here? Constantine? Thanks, Sophia. Um, given the fact that there was a time in my career that was involved with Mountain Pass, I, I would say I have a little bit of a, an inside view. Uh, there's a number of facts that we shouldn't forget. And for the last year, the mine has been operating a Mountain Pass, but the entire output has been going to China. Shanghai uh, Resources in China is the only buyer for that material. Uh, when I say demand, and, and perhaps um, I believe the question may have had something to do with some of the comments that I made, that it's demand that drives supply chains, uh, which I absolutely believe, um, and a few other folks believe as well. Um, demand for rare earths in the United States is anemic. Uh, it could hardly base load a single world-class facility. So when you look at Mountain Pass's business plan, Historically, before it went bankrupt in 2005, it was primarily to serve uh, global markets, not necessarily the United States market, simply because demand doesn't exist in the United States to satisfy a, an operation of 10, 20, 30, 40,000 tons a year that Mountain Pass and Molly Corp at the time were planning. So yeah, demand uh, is, is an essential element of the equation. So when I say that it, you know, demand builds supply chains, yeah, we respond. It's a lot easier for people like me. I have a board and shareholders and I live and die by my quarterly share price. Uh, it's a lot easier for me to respond to what my customers are telling me uh, as opposed to what my suppliers are telling me. So if I have a customer that says, you know, we're going to the moon, we need to build a plant there. Guess what happens? You know, we're going to the moon too. It, it's not. It, it, it's very simple math. Um, your customers pay your bills and you will jump through hoops to, to make sure you will do what it takes to keep them happy. That's why I also made the comment about ESG. When I have my customers auditing my plants once a quarter, once a year, and put a, a, a exhaustive audits to make sure that we that our ESG performance meets their standard, you know, there's, there's a Trend, there's a tendency for those uh, types of behavior to propagate through supply chains. We do the same thing with our suppliers, or we try to do the same thing with our suppliers. So I think companies tend to be much more responsive to what their customers want to do than pretty well. You know, and I guess at the same level, I would put investors and shareholders, but customers have tremendous power to, uh, to shift uh, preferences and behavior through the supply chain. This is, I completely understand this and, and 
it's, it's obvious, but there is this call for the state to play a role. I mean, yes, the companies will move depending on where the demand and supply is, but then that doesn't mean that some companies are not really looking for somebody to carry the risk. I think this idea of the risk, I, I'd like perhaps Rod to talk a little bit more about this. Like who is ensuring all this? Who is, who is carrying the risk? To what extent need the state? I mean, we know the state of affairs right now. Uh, China is dominant in this sector. China already is created the supply chains. They're globalized, interdependent. They have not stopped anybody from uh, buying from them. They haven't weaponized anything, even though there's all the geopolitical talk. Uh, why not let things as they are? I mean, we can still develop the EVs. We can still develop the economy. We can still develop the technologies. Um, why are, is it more political? Is this practical? Is this political? Is it, what do you think, Rod? Risk comes in different flavors and it means different things depending on your perspective. Uh, there's, uh, I think as one of the presenters this morning uh, articulated, uh, we have commercial risks, uh, the physical unavail the threat of physical unavailability of material, uh, the price risk, the, the high and or volatile prices, uh, reputational risks, uh, business risks generally. Uh, there are national security risks. There are risks to the development and deployment of otherwise uh, desirable technologies. And it's this risk to a technology that seems to be driving much of the, well, certainly the discussion of this workshop, but a lot of the discussion in the past year about critical materials has had less to do with national security and military preparedness and more to do with the, the fear the lack of availability of rare earths for motors or lithium and cobalt for batteries or whatever uh, will slow down uh, progress towards what many people call the energy transition. And, and there is a role for government to play, but we have to be careful that I think government's role will be, I would say, carefully uh, circumscribe the, the more purely commercial risks. I think you leave those to the private sector, uh, whereas the risks to technology development, uh, the risks that uh, something doesn't succeed, move it out of the laboratory into practice because there's an impediment in the market. Um, these, this public-private partnership notion, the Manhattan Project notion, uh, is one that, that resonates with me. Uh, I saw that Keith has raised his hand, but and I also want to point out that Julie Klinger is asking, and, and I'm really curious as well. Uh, on the one hand, I just said a moment ago that China hasn't really weaponized the elements, but Keith started us all on this path in 2010 with that famous article about the embargo to Japan. So give us a little bit of context with that, if you, if you will, uh, Keith, and, and whatever else you were thinking about it. Uh, as I reported then, the uh, Chinese Ministry of Commerce called in all of the all the two dozen companies with the export licenses and said none of you are going to export anything on any further supplies to uh, to Japan until further notice. And if any of you export by way of third countries, like shipping to Singapore, and when you know it's going to be transshipped to, uh, to Japan, uh, then we will also shut you down. So that was an example of using the, uh, the production, uh, the control over production for political purposes. That was a territorial dispute between China and Japan over islands just north, uh, uninhabited islands just north of Taiwan. There have been a lot more examples since then of weaponization of trade. Uh, for example, uh, delays in or inability of countries to obtain vaccines from China, depending on their stance uh, towards Taiwan. Uh, you've had a brief delay in Chinese supplies of masks and other medical equipment to, 
uh, to Europe, uh, Netherlands in particular, over, uh, over political stances there. Uh, after Australia called in, on the other direction in terms of demand, uh, after Australia called for an independent investigation into the source of COVID, uh, China halted essentially all purchases of Australian wine, barley, coal, and a number of other products. Uh, actually, coal, they limited the, they didn't stop the imports, but they severely limited them. And then they just stopped them outright in all these other categories. So, um, uh, a, I, I once had an interesting conversation with a, with a Chinese official about how would they be able to get back their money from their loans to a lot of Belt and Road Initiative countries, which are many of which are very poor. And his answer was, it is very clear, and they know it, that uh, we are the overwhelming dominant producer of a wide variety of manufactured products. And if they don't make timely payments, then they will have trouble getting importing things they need. So there is a trade is, is very much uh, at every level, a, a political decision. You see that in whether it's in purchases of Boeings and Airbuses, uh, but you also see that in things like what countries get, uh, get vaccines or face masks, or in this case, uh, rare earth metals. But hasn't this been a weapon that the United States has used as well, and Europe, in fact? As, and as I mentioned in the original article in 2010, reporting that China had secretly halted uh, all exports of rare earth metals to Japan, uh, the analogy I used, uh, the, the historical precedent I used was that in the summer of uh, 1941, the United States uh, and in Britain had halted oil exports to Japan and to protest Japan's, uh, fascist Japan's uh, continued war in China. Uh, so this is a case of the West trying to come to the rescue of, uh, of, uh, of wartime China. And uh, Japan then of course decided that the only solution was for it to, uh, to grab the oil fields and uh, uh, bombed Pearl Harbor and uh, uh, grab the oil fields of uh, of uh, Northern Borneo about four months later. Okay, I wanna, I see that Keith wants to answer, but I wanna also bring Chris into this conversation because one of the things he, you said, Chris, was that the prices for lithium uh, battery production uh, is dropping. On the other hand, we're also trying to produce them sustainably, which has an environmental cost, uh, which we should be paying. So how, how is the industry going to deal with this? I mean, we saw that there's like a, a particular, in the case of rare earths perhaps, because China really has the upper hand here, um, it feels like there, there, there is what Constantine says, a range within which they can play with. What, if, what about lithium? Because lithium is going to be, and cobalt, but lithium in particular um, is really, you know, there's gonna be a tremendous crunch and the cost of the battery for electric uh, vehicles is such a big part of the equation. It is, and, and you know, I think one of the things that complicates matters a little bit is that you have a number of different lithium ion technologies. Um, but the one constant thing across all the technologies is that they all use lithium. Um, and I would argue that as lithium ion batteries evolve and become more energy dense in the coming years, you're likely to use more lithium as opposed to less. You know, how that relates to China has, I think, everything to do with the focus on R&D that I mentioned around solid state batteries. I mean, um, anybody on the call tonight is probably familiar with companies like QuantumScape or uh, Solid Power uh, in the United States that have gone public or are about to go public by a SPAC. You know, I think I think lithium and, and is an interesting um material to look at in the context of China, because while China does have what I would argue are ample lithium resources in the ground, they are not known for their high quality. And so when you see companies like Tianxi or Genfeng, two of the largest lithium producers in the world, they are basically vertically integrated in the sense that they do, they do everything except the mining. Um, that's a little bit of a generalization, but 
Um, typically what happens is hard rock mining and some, some brine is processed, it's, it's, it's mined elsewhere and processed inside China. So, you know, again, it's, it's, it's another interesting um, angle to what I think Keith really talked about, about, about China owning 50, 60, 70, 80% of multiple supply chains. I do think that lithium is is one of these raw materials that I think you could see more bifurcated or localized supply chains around. And a lot of that has to do with you just have uh, very high quality resources elsewhere in the world. And I do think you have the political will to build out refining capacity, for example, here in the United States, or there's been talk about it, obviously, in Europe. I know there's a very, very uh, big push in Europe for, for lithium refining capacity. So you know, I don't really think it's going to change much in terms of China's overall dominance of the supply chain over the next few years. But I do think that if there, if you did want to sort of pick a metal or an element to say, okay, well, how can we start to maybe loosen China's control? I think lithium might be one you want to start with. Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to call on Keith to kind of wrap it up. I want to thank everybody uh, for, for being here. Uh, I'd like to tell Betty that we're going to talk more about mining because mining is, again, is going to really uh, come into focus in some of the next sessions. And this idea of like this bad image of the mining industry generally has, um, in, especially with respect to, because in, in, it has not been going on at least so visibly uh, for uh, you know, let's say OECD countries, so much had been out into the developing world exactly because, well, first of all, they have resources and, and because of a lot of the environmental uh, oversights. But I think mining too, and what Chris said, it's really coming up to speed and it, it's going to have to comply to all of these new regulations and ESG standards. So thank you all. Keith, why don't you wrap it up for us and then we'll reconvene, but thank you everybody for attending. It's unfortunate that the mining industry would have a bad image. And I wouldn't say that I personally have a, a bad image of it. I think what's important is that mining is done in responsible, sustainable ways, which the bigger companies tend to want to do. And it's unfortunate that uh, there has been a not in my backyard approach uh, by some people in uh, wealthy countries to push some of the more dangerous forms of mining into developing countries instead of allowing it to continue with proper regulation in the developed countries. Um, Separately, to add to answer the question, though, so since I started with it on what became of the gangsters, because I saw that also, I see that now in the written questions. So they drove up next to me and the photographer and started uh, saying that they were going to carve me up like an animal in a slaughterhouse uh, in Hakka, which required translation. And uh, so I started walking and I, uh, they drove alongside me at whatever three miles an hour through the mud of this site in their two four wheel drive vehicles with no license plates. Uh, describing in lurid detail what they were going to do to me as I walked out of the mine, it was an open pit mine and uh, jumped in the taxi, but they were also calling clearly their bosses for what exactly to do with me. And the and so we started driving in the taxi towards the highway and more cars clearly from this same crew uh, started speeding after us. Uh, so we ended up with, I think, four vehicles and the taxi driver drove rather briskly under the circumstances. And uh, we got out of the village with the four, the four vehicles following us. But I think they had, they did not, they did not seem, while they were quick to talk in lurid language. I don't think they really had a plan for what to do with a foreigner. I think anything happening to a foreigner would attract more attention. And so I don't think, uh, so I think they had not figured out what they wanted to do with me. And so I, we got, I went, got on the highway, went back to Guangzhou, went straight into the Guangzhou auto show of all places and went to talk to, I had a Nissan interview like that day and I asked them about uh, rare metals in their vehicles. So uh, it's a uh, small world. That's fantastic. Well, on that note, thank you all very much for joining and thank you, uh, seriously, uh, and Keith coming all the way, you know, into this, the meeting from China, but everybody, Constantine, Rod and Chris, thank you so much 
for being with us and for the for all the participants. <laughs>